afternoon. Thank you very much for coming today to hear Victoria Lotman speak to us about it, India's magnificent but largely unknown step wells. It's wonderful to see so many excited people. Oh, did I lose my mic? Projection? Oh, you can hear me? <laughs> It's wonderful to see so many people here that are enthusiastic, as enthusiastic as I am to hear this lecture. And it's a beautiful day outside. I was telling Victoria that often our armchair travel lecture series perfectly work out on a stormy, you know, gray day outside. And so it's a perfect time to be indoors and hear about another destination. But it's a beautiful day. So thank you for making it. I am Lisa Benchia, the manager of travel and special programs here at the museum. SBMA puts on around 18 trips per year around the world. And SBMA travels armchair travel lecture series takes you on a trip to other worldly destinations, all from your armchair on a Sunday afternoon. We have a robust museum travel program to all corners of the world, and this armchair travel series intends to bring those travels to you. In a few weeks, we have a trip going to India. It will be SBMA's 35th trip to India. And we have a group of 22 museum members um, about to go. And uh, I think about half of you are in the audience today. So welcome to all of you, as well as many past India travelers. I've been on two trips to India with the museum, and I saw many of you here today as well. Um, and welcome also to many uh, Friends of Asian Art members who are here today. And thank you to Susan Tai for suggesting that we do this lecture as part of our um, armchair travel lecture series. Susan Tai is our curator, uh, Elizabeth Atkins, um, curator of Asian art, and Friends of Asian Art is her curatorial support group. And before, we, um, before I tell you a little bit about Victoria, a reminder to please turn off all cell phones. Victoria Lotman is a veteran journalist who recently relocated to Los Angeles from Chicago. She holds a BA in anthropology and an MA in art history and works for the Smithsonian Institution's Hirshhorn Museum before embarking on a career as an arts and culture journalist. During three decades in Chicago, she hosted and produced several long running radio programs dedicated to the arts, literature, architecture, and design and contributed to dozens of international newspapers and magazines including Architectural Digest, Architectural Record, Metropolitan Home, the Chicago Tribune, El Decor, and many others. Victoria began traveling extensively in India in the early 80s, eventually developing an obsession with the country's little known step wells. She spent years documenting hundreds of the subterranean structures through articles and photographs, and her landmark book, The Vanishing Stepwells of India, was published in 2017 by Merrill Publishers London. You may purchase her book. It costs $60.54, I believe, for members um, after the lecture, and she will be happy to sign it for you. To date, she's photographed 200 step wells, and in addition to writing the book and numerous articles on the topic, her work has been the subject of several exhibitions, most recently at UCLA's Fowler Museum. And I know many of you either saw that exhibition at the Fowler or, um, or heard about it. One more thing I wanted to let you know that even though this is our first uh, in the series of our armchair travel lecture series um, for this spring and we haven't advertised anything else, I'll have you be the first to know that on February 23rd, we will have a talk on the taste and traditions of French Polynesia and um, stories and legends and culture and history. And we have a trip coming up to French Polynesia in September. So that will be really fun. And then on, and that's February 23rd, and then on March 1st, Daniel Stone, who's here in the audience today, hi Daniel, will be speaking on the true story of an American food spy who traveled the world and transformed what America eats. So that will be sent out by email, you don't have to write it down now or to mark your calendar, you'll get an email as long as you're a member and you're on our list. Um, if you're not, please feel free to tell me after the lecture and I'll make sure that you receive that information. I think I speak for all of us when I say how pleased we are to hear Victoria's take on these fascinating structures. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Victoria Lotman. Thank you. 
you. That's so great. That was a really good introduction. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. I'm always so impressed when I hear myself described because I can <laughs> promise you that none of that's happening anymore. But I did do all that stuff once upon a time. And uh, I really want to thank Lisa um, and Susan for bringing me here. It's been, uh, you know, a, a wonderful thing to come up here. And I would be, can you turn that down a little bit, Jim? I know you were planning on doing it. Uh, it, it I can't believe you're here. It is so beautiful out there. I was kind of wandering around on stage. I'm like, oh my God, I got to go give my talk. So thank you for coming. Uh, and I just, I want to do this before I forget, because I get a lot of phone calls, particularly from people who've seen the book or the exhibition about, uh, usually from photographers saying, what kind of camera do you use? And what lens? And what's your DPI? And all these things, which I cannot answer. I am not a photographer, I'm a journalist. I never ever expected to have a book or exhibition or even to become obsessed with such a um, strange kind of eccentric arcane topic. And this is one of um, <laughs> literally a couple of the cameras that I used over the course of eight years. I would go into Best Buy and say, you know, what's about $200 and never read anything about it. Always said on automatic. I don't know the lighting, sit there, sometimes I have to put in my teeth as I slide down into some of these things that are in really bad shape. And the idea, my point is that anybody can be a great photographer. Like if I can do this with no training, no idea how to use a camera, you can do it too. Books, exhibitions, magazines, so yay for junky cameras, that's all I can say. <laughs> um, people do ask me though, and I, with, and it makes sense. Well, why did you get obsessed with these? How did you first get interested in step wells? And before I define what a step well is, because that's super boring when you begin to say what they are, here's what happened. And this could happen to you. 32 years ago, on my first trip to India, I was um, in uh, Gujarat, the state of Gujarat, traveling around with some architects, looking at modern architecture, as it were. And one day, I was taken to outside the city to an area that was just like this desert patch outside of Ahmedabad, the capital city. There was no grass there. There were no trees, no radio. It was just like this dirt patch with this very unassuming wall in the distance. And the taxi driver said, you know, get out and go look over that wall. And I thought, Right, you go look over it. You know, it didn't really make sense to me, but but I did. Um, and, and in doing that, that was the moment that you know my life kind of pivoted. Not immediately. It took another thirty years, but I looked over that banal wall, and the ground fell away into this obviously man-made chasm. An old. Can everybody hear me? By the way, it's okay back there. Yeah. That, that plunged, I couldn't even tell how far deep it was or how long it was. But you have no idea how transgressive an experience it is. We are taught, conditioned, to look up at architecture or to look across at architecture, but we are never expecting to look down into architecture. And that moment was so shocking to me. Uh, that I really, it was, it was an astonishing experience. I had no idea what I was looking at. But the experience of descending into a step well, particularly one of these ornate ones that's in relatively good shape, it was sort of an assault on my senses. Every sense becomes heightened. Uh, as you, I couldn't tell how far deep it was. This one stretches six stories into the earth. It's important to remember these are subterranean structures. So the ground level, you know, is up here and you're going all the way down into that. Because of this and because of these towering columns and platforms moving your your the perspective shifts constantly and you're it's it's very disorienting. You never get a real fix on a particular location and I couldn't see how deep I was or how far I was going. But the harsh light of India in, the, in uh, Ahmedabad, that bright, bright light, began to dim the further down I went. And the 
hot air, and it can be 120 degrees above ground if you go there in the summer, became cooler and cooler the deeper I went. And the dryness became almost like this um, enveloping damp. And the sounds, and you know if you've been to India, the cacophony, the din that you get above ground became hushed the further down you went. So that by the time you go to the bottom and you get to the bottom of this looking up, it's literally as though I felt like I'd entered another realm. I was just transformed. And that's exactly how it would have been experienced 500 years ago when women and men were using this at the time. That's why I became obsessed, but it was a slow burn. And I kept going back to India um, for years. I must have gone a dozen times over the next 20, five years, and felt that I could get it out of my system if I just kept going to India for a couple weeks at a time and did a touristy things and went to all the areas I was interested in. And finally, I realized that I could not get it out of my system, that I had to get it into my system. And I switched my entire career at that point. I was still living in Chicago, um, you know, doing radio, writing, all that stuff you heard, and decided I was going to dig into India. And I went there for three months, one winter, uh, and one of the stories that I began to research was the Stepwells, because I remember that that experience was so powerful that I thought, now I have time to go back and see if that indelible memory is as powerful, deserves to be that powerful. And instead what happened is I became obsessed and it took over my life. And that is the story of one girl's obsession. So now, if I had started this by saying, Step wells were ancient water harvesting structures starting 1,500 years ago, and they were deployed all through the country. I mean, that's a very dry way of putting it. But that's what they were. They were very, very sophisticated structural machines, pre-industrial machines, for making sure that water was available 24-7 all year long in one of the most uh, crazy climates um, on Earth. In, uh, India, it's bone dry 10 months of the year in the western parts and in Rajasthan in the states where these proliferated, although you find them pretty much all over the country. It could be bone dry for 10 months out of the year and then a deluge of water for two months. And so being able, to, knowing, having that predictable um, sequence meant that you could plan for those things to happen and make sure that you could um, harvest that water, keep it uh, close all year long. So essentially, a step well was basically just a long trench that dug down to the water table. This draw well, this like long well here, was where the water could be found at the driest ebb, which could be, in some cases, you'll see 13 stories under the surface. You had to get down to that level because then, during the dry season, you would have to traverse all of those stairs in order to draw the water out at its lowest ebb. But then, during the rainy season, when the groundwater <coughs> became much more flush, these could fill up sometimes to the top and didn't, necessitated no walking downstairs at all. It was a very um, efficient system that worked for 1,500 years. And you can see, now I've never been during the monsoon to India when these, uh, the ones that still function, uh, when they can still uh, have plentiful water. But this is just one of the many step wells in Delhi, by the way, the oldest one in Delhi, but uh, one that really nobody ever sees. And you can see this is during a fairly dry time when the water's all the way down there, but then those stairs just become completely submerged during a rainier time, and you can see it fills up to this level, it's actually gone up even higher than that. But water, harvesting water, was just one of the functions that was important for these. And that was one of the things that I found fascinating, is that they weren't simply water harvesting structures. They performed more functions than other uh, structures in India of their day. They were civic centers where, um, where the communities could, could gather. They were spiritual centers, particularly for Hindus, where these became subterranean temples uh, or pilgrimage sites where people would travel and do their daily worship. 
They were very important along trade routes in areas where water was very hard to find and caravans could tie up at some of these for days at a time and you needed to know where they were spaced along a route so that you could continue sort of like Lawrence of Arabia where they knew where that one, you know, the one water hole was. Other than that, you would probably die. They were very important social um, centers for women in particular whose daily chore it was and still is to collect the water supply twice a day and meeting at a well during um, these periods where their lives are so constrained in India, particularly then, uh, it's not necessarily that much better now, meeting at the well, um, gathering with the other women would have been a very important respite in their lives. And speaking of women, it was also another function that was very important was that they were charitable gifts to the community. They were very expensive to build to commission one of these in your neighborhood, in your town, wherever it was that one of these was going to get built, they were expensive, even if they weren't ornate ones. Uh, and so you got a lot of brownie points with the community. And if you were Hindu, they were uh, akin to building a temple. They were actually listed as as important as building a temple was building a step well. Uh, but Muslims built them too. They were really uh, Jains. Every segment of society commissioned these, but they were value, expensive uh, propositions. And it's believed that 25% of them were commissioned by women, generally, uh, to commemorate their dead husbands. Uh, and so whenever there's a step well that's called Rani Key whatever, or Rani this or Rani that, it was a queen or a wealthy uh, donor that did it. Now, I, and both of these were commissioned by women, by the way. I, I say a lot, it is thought that, um, it's almost like legalese, like I don't want to be pinned down. It's actually that there is so little factual information that has ever been found about these, because as you will see later, they just fell off history's grid. They weren't um, maintained, they weren't important. So whatever historical records existed about them, it's very hard to locate that. And so you'll see in some cases, and in my book too, like I would be looking for something and there'd be either no date, no name, we have no idea who built it, or there might be three dates across four different centuries. And so when I say it's thought that, none of that kind of information is known. It's just what I'm reading, what the research that I've done, all of those things sort of going into the mix. Um, another important uh, use for these is its cooling centers. It did, it does get very hot in India. And when you get to the bottom of one of these steples, it can be 10 degrees cooler at the bottom than at the top. Uh, and you frequently, um, after the Muslims came to India, you see this kind of Islamic style that had these long arcades going down the sides where you could literally stay and sleep and spend a lot of time in these cool apartments. And in parts of Gujarat where you see just these um, kind of bridging elements. And believe me, I was taking advantage of some of those when I was out, as long as I could get rid of those guys, malingering. But you know, the, what's, what's astounding about these is just the vast variety of them. Uh, no two are alike. They're like fingerprints or snowflakes. You never see two stepples that are alike. And except for one that's actually, it was like it was twin. They did a mirror thing across. That's the only time that's ever happened. But they can be very small and intimately scaled or just enormous. Like you cannot even imagine how they could have built something at the time that they did. They can be incredibly um, just, non-ornamented, uh, just very basic and utilitarian or incredibly ornate with a lot of bells and whistles. The shapes, they vary too. The most common one is this kind of linear form. And this one on the left, which is like you could just shoot it, you know, an arrow down the middle, like, boom, it's really, really long. This very long straight channel that was, um, a trench, but there are a lot of L-shaped ones and no explanation why somebody would have chosen that as a form, whether it had to do with the geography or who knows. Round ones are, I don't, that's the one on the left, the right you're saying that about, right? This, this one, this Nautilus shell, I know it's like the simplest one and everybody just loves it, it's so beautiful. And then you get these just crazy eccentric things, the one on the left, very Escher-like, people always talk about Escher when they see step wells, or um, these octagonal ones, which I've seen a number of. They're just a vast number of, you know, I've seen a 
200, 200 plus, that's a fraction of what exists. And there's no, it's unknown how many there are. There's also a type of step one that is specifically designed by its, by its des, uh, defined by its design, and it's a kund. And these you always recognize because they have pyramidal shaped stairs. I'll show you an example in a minute. But they're very, very steep. Like approaching the edge of one of these is like coming to a cliff edge. And they, they descend very steeply like a shovel shape. Um, and, and they are really, they are seriously scary to go down. Oh, I can't believe I did it. Yes, I went down every single one of these. I go to the bottom of every single one of these, even crying some of the time. <laughs> and you cannot take a bad picture of a kund. They're just beautiful objects. And this one I have to throw in because it's so strange. This is in Varanasi. Uh, and in just in a neighborhood, like it's hard to find, but this is one of the hardest ones that I ever had to deal with because Varanasi is one of the oldest continually lived in cities on the planet. And the only, there's very few references to this step well, but when they reference it at all, they just say it's very old. So what does that mean? Like that's a philosophical, like existential thing. What does very old mean in one of the oldest cities on earth? So in my book, I think I just like, uh, uh, okay, 1,000. I just like came up with, I just pulled it out of the air. Because what was I going to say? I had this, you know, I had this publisher like, you got to come up with a date. You can't just have a question mark. So it says 1,000, but could be anything. I don't know. You tell me. Now, when I was there, um, <laughs> There were really no people. There was one guy who was just getting dressed. He had been bathing in there. But you see a lot of these clothes around. One day a year during the monsoon in India, and I will never go see this because it terrifies me, the idea of this, 10,000 couples show up in Varanasi specifically to get to this kund, which at the time the water is blessed so that when women dip in it, they are basically promised to have a child, a boy child, it's never a girl child. They're going to have a boy baby. And you have to get down into the water, get wet, or dip it, pour it over yourself, and then you remove your wet clothes, put on something new, leave your clothes behind along with a donation in that pool of a fruit or vegetable that you promise never to eat again, or jewelry, which is like even better, because this is the priest who's grabbing it all, <laughs> paying for the cleanup effort. <laughs> it must look like, it looks like Woodstock afterwards. But that's, <laughs> that's what it looks like one day a year. You can't even see the water. OK, so those, that gives you a little bit of the background and the style of these. But the actual history begins somewhere around 300 AD, we think, 3 to 500 AD, when the first rudimentary steppos were cut out of solid rock. People realized we could get the water all year long if we could just cut steps and walk down to the water instead of waiting for that thing to fill up. These are not old ones, but it gives you an idea about what a rock cut one is like. It was still a lot of work to cut through these stones. But right around 600, are the oldest structural step wells appear. They're in Gujarat. There's three or four of them in a very um, close area of the state. And um, you can see that they're very narrow. They're really sort of tentative. But even then, there are these niches where deities would have been put. And you can still make a couple out. These things were added later. Uh, it's interesting to me, because this is, the, this is the oldest step well, theoretically, in India, unless they find another one it's from 600 AD. And it's just filled with trash. It was so scary to go down those steps, like kicking garbage out of the way, sliding a step, kicking in. Because like when you get to the edge there, you have no way of knowing how deep that pit is. As it happened, it was like maybe 10 feet. I wouldn't have killed myself. But I thought I would kill myself if I fell into it. It's really scary looking. And I think of like the oldest house in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's the oldest house in America. It's like this adobe mud thing, like this big. And if you touch it, like that's it, you're thrown in jail. Like they would, like horns blaring. And this thing from 600 AD, they couldn't even find it. They couldn't tell me how to find it in this little tiny town. And it's filled with trash. So it just goes to show you like the difference in history. Like that's not even that ancient history in India. 
So within a couple hundred years of figuring out how to build a structural hole in the ground so that you could access water, everything started to change. And this step well is one of the oldest actual structural step wells, one of the largest and deepest in India. It's on the road, just off the road, I would say, in a town called Abhaneri between Jaipur and Agra. How many people have driven between Jaipur and Agra? Yeah, a lot of you. How many of you have seen this? I mean, it's just like, don't you want to cry? Don't you want to sue your tour company? I was just haranguing Lisa about this. Like, no, you have got to tell them. It's 15 minutes off that road. It's one of the most extraordinary structures. There's just nothing like it. How do we not know about this? But more than the fact that it is extraordinary, 3,500 steps, it also represents a kind of a transporter malfunction in a way from history. It was originally built around 800 by the local Hindu ruler, King Chand, which means moon. And still, down here in these niches are the original deities that were at the water level to bless the water. They would have been submerged periodically, of course, when the water came up. But this is very typical Hindu architecture of the time, very flat, these straight um, little columns, flat terraces like this. And then a thousand years later, the local Muslim ruler, we don't even know who actually did it, I've seen no reference to it, in the 18th century decided to add uh, more rooms to this structure and created this kind of Islamic palace uh, just like a pleasure palace, a place that they would go when it was hot out and the women would be there and th these would have been hung with beautiful fabrics and they just slammed it right on top of the Hindu one. So you get this beautiful, and you can tell this, these um, columns and this type of arch, those were brought to India by, by Islam. They didn't exist in the uh, Hindu architectural canon. So to see this structure separated by a thousand years, two faiths, two styles, a thousand years, very, very rare. And it's an incredible structure. And I'm sure you want to go back now and see it and wonder why you didn't get to. So from that period on, step wells proliferated really all over India. They, as I said, I've seen 200 plus in, I don't know, maybe 10 states. and. I wasn't even being that intentional about it. But you would get them everywhere. These are both from uh, different forts where step wells had to exist because often the forts were under siege for centuries at a time. Or you'd find them in huge cities like this is, uh, the one on the left is uh, from the city, uh, well, it's in Haryana. I forget the name of the city. It's not Narnal. But anyway, um, in Hyderabad on the right. What is the name of that? Anyway, I'll come up with it. But they were, they were everywhere. And in fact, large cities like Delhi had 100 step wells in its heyday by the time the British came. 100 step wells, every little neighborhood, every different ethnic group, every religious group. You got them in villages. The one on the left is in this little agricultural community. The one on the right, ditto. Like everywhere that there was a population that needed water and needed to have a lot of water, not just a draw well, would have a step well. And then, of course, out in the hinterlands along these uh, trade routes. And one of the things that I, I, I love about the step wells is, but it's also really aggravating, the one on the right is a perfect example, is that even if you know it's there, you can't find it. They are hiding in plain sight. Some of them are like across the street from your tourist hotel, or, and you don't even, you can't even tell, either because they're behind a, uh, behind a wall, or because it's like this, there's not even a wall there. I drove past this five times in an hour, but this was the only thing sticking up, and I just wasn't attuned to it. Or in Delhi, this is at the Red Fort, one of the most touristed sites in Delhi. Uh, fantastic step well there that nobody goes to see. And I mean, it is kind of dangerous. Like if you know it's there, it helps. Because if you didn't and you were walking along like and a bird screeches at you and you look up, you fall into this thing. Because there's nothing to keep you from doing it. They were just, they were not announcing their presence by a physical structure, not in all cases. 
This is a particularly interesting one. Those of you who are going to be in Delhi and want to drive your tour guide crazy, ask him to find the step well. It's uh, near the, um, the army barracks. And they don't know the date of this. They think it's from around 1400. They're not sure who built it. But it's a beautiful, it's not even L-shaped. It's just, it's, it's um, I mean, it is an L, but it's very, it's like a mirror image of itself. And when the British came, and they were using this as a jail for freedom fighters in the mid 40s before partition. And you can see where a number of these windows have been filled in. They still have like the, the jail cells and the bars in there from where they kept these freedom fighters. For a long time, the uh, archaeological survey, which took this over after the British left, um, first the army took it over and turned it into a latrine. And then the uh, archaeological survey took it over, and we're going to turn it into an actual museum for freedom fighters. But they haven't done that as yet. But another one in Delhi, and I think this is the one Lisa and I were talking about. Uh, this is like two blocks from one of the, the, the heart of Delhi shopping in Connaught Place. Loud, raucous, insane. On this little quiet street, residential street, an Indian man came up to me after I showed him this. He's like, I went to school down that street. I never knew that was there. I'm like, well, yeah, you have to look on the other side of a wall to know it's there. And it's funny because it's become very Pavlovian for me. When I go to India, anytime I see a wall, I go like running over and like, step well, step well. Like, and there's never anything. I have never been rewarded with a step well. But usually, you know, there's cows or something. Anyway, so you see this wall, it's just this nondescript wall, go through the gate, walk up the steps, and then wham! And, and this, this looks impressive because you don't expect it to be there. You don't expect to plunge into the earth. It's actually, now that I've seen 200 wells, it's very simple. There's, it's not that interesting. But it's interesting by virtue of how surprising it is and where it is. At the time this was built, it would have been on the outskirts of what, where the Delhi capital was at that time, which was still miles away. So this would have been used for pilgrims and people coming in and out of the city. It, uh, it has those you know, rows of little apartments. It's, it's lovely. This would have probably been covered with plaster. Um, it's interesting to note, when you look at the different materials that are made, you can tell a lot about the region by what is, the step was built out of. And Delhi is really, really rocky. So you get this kind of rubble-filled structure, whereas down in Gujarat, where the soil is really loose, you get these giant blocks of stone in Rajasthan, too. Now, when I first started seeing this, like eight years ago, there was never anybody there. And it was always coming up on, because they love this in India, the most haunted places in Delhi, the most haunted places in India. Agra Sen Kibali came up on that list. But then, just a few years ago, a, um, a Bollywood movie called PK, this huge hit, it was like the biggest hit ever, with Amir Khan took place. It's, it's really dumb. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I just think it's dopey. And I love a lot of Bollywood movies. This one's stupid. It's about an alien, and he ends up living in this step well. So now when you go there, it's just filled with like canoodling youngsters, like sneaking off into those little areas. It's great. Like it's nice to see it activated by something other than ghosts. And, then, and this is another one that most people never get to see, but it's on the road from Delhi to Jaipur, uh, about halfway, two and a half hours out of that trip. You can stop in the fortress of Nimrana, have a great lunch overlooking the whole plain of Rajasthan. And this step well, which is just a little ways outside of the tiny little town of Nimrana, this is where I got really, after that initial shock, from 30 years ago. This was where I'd been looking at some more step wells, and this was where I thought, okay, now I'm hooked. Because you're just driving along, doo 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 doo, and there's, you know, this wall, okay, we're used to the wall, and you, you get up, and you can't even really, when you look down and you're seeing the top of the next level down there, you know you're in for a wild ride. And this Nimrana step well, it's just enormous and in terrible shape and scary, and there's, you know, bats and bees and bugs, and uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's, um, 
and yet nobody knows anything about it. Like you can see this from Google Earth. There's three different dates associated with it. I chose 1570 because it just looked a lot like the ones from that period. Um, they think that it was maybe commissioned as famine relief in the region, but it's unknown as yet until more Indians step forward and start doing the hard research, looking up Urdu texts and things. We may never know about this, but it's, it's an astonishing place. And it's, it's nine levels down, like up here, ground level. Actually, ground level is even above that. So by the time you get down, there's another level deeper. You are deep into the earth. And it's a profound feeling going down that deep. OK, so now we are going to Gujarat, where um, the oldest step wells are. And, and it's interesting. Gujarat is where uh, this, and right outside of this city in particular, was actually, I'm going to save that thought. Let me just, let's go back to, this is now something you, you recognize. Whenever you see that I'm showing a wall with green, that there's going to be some extraordinary step well. And the earliest ones are in Gujarat, and the earliest ones are all Hindu, because that's, that's what India was at that time, before the Muslims began uh, uh, to take over, coming in around 1300, but really, you know, they basically they were the ruling class until the British took over from them. And Rani Kivab, unlike the other step wells, actually pronounce wow, Rani Kivab. Uh, it's very hard to pronounce V's in India. Uh, unlike all the other ones, we know almost specifically what happened here. We know who built it. It was Queen Udayamati in 1062 because there is a uh, panel that was found, which we sometimes get, a dedication panel that talks about how great she is and did, she did this great thing for the community and this is the date. And she did it to honor her king, Bindev. Uh, and it is the most grandiose, costly structure, step well, that was ever built. And you can't even really get a sense of how big it is. And you know, these are those, those kun steps that are used to like get from here to here really fast. But if you, if you drew them out like that, this thing would like be starting all the way like over there. It's enormous. This gives you an idea of just how big. But this is what it looked like on the left when the British saw it in the 19th century. Uh, a calamity happened here. And this is interesting because how many, there may have been thousands of step wells that had calamities, or people were buried in them, or they collapsed. Or, but how would we know? This one we knew that. But we couldn't, we didn't know specifically until after uh, the Archaeological Survey of India began to excavate it in the 1980s. All that was known was that there was this thing sticking up here and these like stubby column tops. Now, how would you know what was under there? When they began to dig it up, this is what they found. You can see how deep this is, and they haven't even gotten down to the bottom in that picture. It, uh, it turned out that sometime after this was completed, maybe within 100 years, the underground water source, the water table, what was feeding the water table in this case was a river, the Saraswati River, changed course, busted through the wall at the back of the cylinder, filled it up with water and silt, and walls collapsed, and it wrote all the silt for, you know, a thousand years came up to the top, 800 years. And it was only when they started digging it out that they could understand what had happened there. It was like discovering Herculaneum or Pompeii. Everything was in such great shape. I mean, this is what happened after they uh, you know, put everything back and dusted it off. There's like over 700 of the most beautiful sculpture from the mid 11th century. Uh, and no two columns, these ornately carved columns, no two of them are carved are alike. And um, I said to this guy who had, this 
journalist interviewed me before I came here and did that article. And I said to him, because I've been thinking about it, I have tried to find a structure from 11th century anywhere in the world that is as ornate as this structure is. And building down, I've talked to a lot of engineers about this, building down into the earth, the forces that are subject, that you're subject to building down as opposed to building up um, against gravity are so much harder to deal with that to me, again, the idea that this structure, which became a UNESCO heritage site a couple of years ago, but that it's not known, that it's not in history books, in architecture history books, to me it's just like impossible. It's, it's like inexplicable. Just gives you some of the detail of this place. You just don't even know where to look. It's so extraordinary. But, um, you know, keep your eye on these columns here, you know, and these kind of details. Because all the stone that you see in that, it's in Patan. It's a city that's about an hour outside Ahmedabad. Um, all of that stone had to be brought in by hand from 140 kilometers away. None of it exists in that town. And so over the years, the columns that were still sticking up above that, you know, the, the dirt line had been carried away and um, cannibalized. And when you drive through the town of Patan, there's other stuff there, uh, you see houses that have like a little column here or like a little deity there. But it's kind of cute. You can play like fine Ronnie Kibau. But, but the best is this, which is just five kilometers away. And again, like 800 years later, this man, Bahadur Singh, who allegedly owned the property that Rani Kibau was on, decided that he needed to build a step out to irrigate his property. That was another use of these. You weren't just drinking the water, you're using it for ablutions, for washing. You could also use it to uh, irrigate your lands. And these were all farmlands around there. So, you know, if there's no stone around, what are you going to do? Why is he going to import it? He just went down the street to Rani Kibau, hauled all that back and installed it here. But I want you to just pay attention to those three domes right there. Just remember those. So none of this, Bahadur, he just grabbed this stuff and ran with it and stuck it in here. And you can see that some of them didn't quite fit. Uh, he just like cut them down and shoved them in there. Um, I have pictures of like, he even, like the, the uh, deities are like put in at a weird angle, but it's a fantastic step, but it's very, it's very, uh, it's like even narrower than this room, about half the size. And so the feeling you get in there, that feeling of awe and descending into the earth and all those sensory issues that I talked about, you feel them here. You can't feel them at Rani because it's so big and it's open to the sky now. So it's funny that this ersatz 19th century shell actually gives you a better experience of an 11th century step well than that step well did. But he just stole it all. <laughs> and why not? He preserved it. Um, but you know, I told you to pay attention to that, uh, that dome. So here's what I was gonna say about, uh, about Islam in India and what happened. In Gujarat and in Ahmedabad, uh, in particular, this was a city that was uh, founded it was founded in 1411, I couldn't remember the date, by Ahmad Shah. And it's a, he, was, you know, he was the ruling Muslim king at that time, but his subjects were largely Hindu. And uh, they were like any ruling group. I mean, the Hindus destroyed a lot of Muslim buildings and the Muslims destroyed a lot of Hindu temples. But even though there's a fantastic tradition of water architecture in the Islamic world, if you've been to you know, the Alhambra, any Muslim building. They have water courses and fountains. They were just, it was fantastic what they did with water, but they never had they built a step well. They'd never seen a step well. And they were as, you know, oops, as caught up with them as I was. And there were edicts written not to harm a step well. You could tear down the temple, tear down everything else, tear down the palace, don't harm the step well. And they eventually then began building their own step wells. And the Muslim step wells are beautiful. Hindu, they all are. I'm not making a judgment call. But there is a brief moment where the two came together and created a style, a sort of um, Islamic Hindu, Islamadu style that only existed briefly. Because 
even though the Hindus had the structure and they had the technology, Islamic architecture had the true dome, the true arch, the octagon, a lot of flourishes that the Hindus had not seen. And when the two of them came together in Ahmedabad around 1500 in the late 15th, early 16th century, it created these beautiful, beautiful structures. They look Hindu because they've got, they're so ornate. And you think, oh yeah, there's a deity in there. Oh, and you know, I'm used to seeing all of this like tchotchke up structure. But in fact, there are no deities. They were appealing to the Hindu population and using Hindu craftsmen who'd been building these things for centuries. And that's what they knew how to do. But they were no longer building them using the type of deities and um, even figurative, uh, like animals, fell away from it. So that before, when you would have seen this in a niche, a couple of deities, you get something that looks a lot like the Tree of Life that works both for Hindu and Islamic patrons of the stepwell. Very clever. But they brought something else that was super weird, and that is a retreat step, or what is called a retreat, a private stepwell, where before all of these stepwells were used in communities, they were very uh, open, you know, you could see them, you could get to them and look into them um, if you were part of that community. But the idea of a well that was private for a family, for the king, for some wealthy person in their garden or in their palace or at their fort, that was a new idea that was just for this was something that only happened after the uh, Islamic incursion. And you get these things that look like bunkers. I mean, look at this thing. It's like, would you ever think there was anything even under that except maybe, you know, like rods from a nuclear testing site or something? <laughs> That's what it looked like. You can't even go in here anymore. But once you go in, and this is a very simple one, but it's, it's beautiful and it gives you the idea. It's just this giant sort of octagonal thing and water is hauled up from the middle. And the women, light, light came in through these, this is one of the only ones that were actually people in there. They were as shocked to see me as I was to see them. They were probably more shocked to see me. But, you know, middle-aged Caucasian girl from, at that point, the Midwest, like stumbling around this place. Uh, this is one of the only places that I could never, could not go in in a step. But like, I make myself go every place. But behind this dark, that brick, this is where women would have, that's where they would have spent their days. It would have been cool. They could haul up water. When it got dark, these were filled with oil lamps. But the screeching of bats coming out of there, <laughs> I just, I thought, oh, right, I'm going to go in with that camera. I'm going to take a picture like this, and they're all going to come right in my face. So I never went in that room. For all I know, the most beautiful thing in India is in that room, <laughs> guarded by bats. <laughs> This is another one. Um, this is on the grounds of the, the Red Fort in Agra. And this is, was so little known that the man who manages the Red Fort for the archaeological survey had no idea where it was. Like, I had dispensation to go and find it. I had found references to it. I'm not the only person who's written about step wells. There's, in fact, my work is based on research of other people who are far more uh, scholarly than I. But we had to figure out how to get into this thing. And again, it's like a subway grate in New York. But we go into it, and it's not ornate. These pictures that I'm showing are not ornate. But what this is is such an engineering marvel that, again, I keep using the term astonishing. I'm going to have to, if you can come up with an even better word that sounds that good, I'll use it. It goes down seven stories underground, seven stories. And this is what it actually is. This is how complex this is. This room here, double story, I was in there, painted all along the top. I don't even know. And the water in this one, these were not used to, for drinking water. I mean, maybe they could. It was mainly used for the women and the royals of uh, Akbar's family at that time 
to go in and cool off. It was a private bathing retreat well, and it was just a beautiful, cool place to spend the day. But there are winding staircases going all around here, and there's a whole other separate staircase going straight here all the way up to the surface that they thought went right to, for him to use privately so he can get down to see his ladies really fast. It's like an incredible structure. But again, this is like, that's what it looks like from the outside. <laughs> Crazy, some of this stuff here was from the 40s during the British, like. Okay, so, so this is the part that's really depressing, like what happened, like how did this illustrious tradition of these phenomenal buildings that don't exist anywhere else in the world, there are cisterns, there are wells, there are water with steps, but there's nothing that functions in the way the steppos were made to function with this kind of fluctuating water table because no other place had that kind of um, capricious climate. And there are a lot of reasons why things went, you know, went awry, went off the grid, although still no, no excuse for the current state of these things. But by the 18th century, the Mughal Empire the Muslims, they were fracturing uh, at that point, and the British were already in India, and so the, the British Raj was on the rise, and the Mughal Empire was on the way out, and because they were expensive, nobody was willing to suddenly you know, start investing in a giant pit in the ground that was gonna cost a lot of money, at a time when nobody really, there was no seat of power, everything was really fluctuating. Uh, and it also coincided with the rise of technology like pumps in the middle of a town, or uh, water tanks in the town, or eventually plumbing. So if you had a choice between walking downstairs, carrying a jug on your head twice a day, or obviously going to the village pump, what are you going to do? But what happened was that since that was the primary purpose, once you untethered these structures from their primary purpose, at which point they had been, they were always cleaned, they were always taken care of, uh, people did not put trash in them, they did not throw things in them. Once they became untethered, there was no looking back. There was no reason to keep them, uh, to keep them in that kind of condition. Um, Today, I and mean, there's so much I can say on this topic, I mean, today, they're not all in that horrible shape, but the vast preponderance of, of them is. The ones that I see, there's maybe, um, I would say 80% are in pretty bad shape, and 20% are, are uh, preserved by the government, and then some of that 80% are protected by the government, <laughs> But this is, but protection by the government just means they go and put up a sign that says you can't spit or litter here and you'll be fined 500 rupees if you damage something and yet you go in and there's just crap, they're everywhere, they're just destroyed. But even when they're still being used, as many still are, they're still being used as, uh, as temples or pilgrimage sites, even those are often like maybe the one place where the deity is is in, even that isn't in the greatest shape, but the rest of it, you know, is covered with trash. And look at, these are like, you know, 13th century carvings on the left there. But what also happens is these have become, like this particular one, which is a fantastic step well in Gujarat, in a walled city, it's wonderful, Wadvan. Um, it was so hard for me to find it on Google Maps. I had to, uh, on Google Earth, I, I insisted on putting in the, uh, the GPS coordinates uh, in my book because I cannot tell you how hard it is to find some of these. Like days, hours, going around asking people, showing pictures, trying to find something. And trying to find this from Google Earth, it took me hours and hours. I finally gave up and I hired a friend of mine in Ahmedabad to go and find it. And he gave me the coordinates because this may have been outside the city, like the one I showed you in Delhi, that's now embedded in the city. Uh, the city grew up around these, and you cannot even get a clear view of them. In order to get this, I had to go around these houses on the outside here, knocking on doors and saying, you know, please may I come and see your step well? And like that would get you shot in the face here if I tried that. Can you imagine? Like, hi, you don't know me, but can I look at... Anyway, people were like, yes, come in, marry our son, have tea, come stay for a week. It was really great. 
another one that's totally buried. And this one, which is a fantastic, look, it's 12th century stepwell. And I can't even tell what this looked like, but it had three entrances at one point. It's been completely built over and parts of it taken away and used as the foundation of another building. But it's just a gorgeous structure. Even this, which looks so beautiful, is like slowly breaking down the, uh, the structure. Or one, that, one of the hardest ones to find. Um, <laughs> I mean, I found it. It's in the zoo. It's embedded in the zoo in Jodhpur, or was. I have some updates on some of these now. My book is out of date. And I finally found it by looking through like a fence that was covered with stuff. And I could see there's the step. Well, oh, but it's in the zoo. And this guy was the only man in India that would not be bribed. No matter what I offered him, he would not take me to see the step. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, that's just not possible. I finally had to go and find and call and make the. So he finally, really grumpy, took me through the goose enclosure. <laughs> you know. So I could go and see this, which is an incredible, there's a couple here we're talking about the cistern in um, Istanbul, and very much reminded me of that, because a lot of these have fallen down. We don't know anything about this. This is me guessing. The archaeological survey had no idea, but it, somebody from Jodhpur just told me they're actually now working on this, and they've moved the zoo. And I just, I wonder if my book has had that impact. I don't know. I'm almost done, by the way. Or, and this is another government protected one. This is how great it's protected. There's a sign outside this place talking about how it's government protected. But this turns out to be a place where you, it's like a, when you go and you buy plants, it's like a landscaping place, but a government, well, they just decided to protect it by building this on top of it, right there. This is all brand new structure on top of a 13th century building. I go back and I look at some of my you know, favorite ones just to see what's happened over the years. This is like, uh, I think there was two or three years between these. Now, on the left, nobody uses this step well, but it was obviously cared for. Like somebody was sweeping it. They were doing something to it because this is what it looks like now. And it's just like malevolent. Like it looked really jaunty before. Like kind of, woo. And now it's like, get out. It's just <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Another one where it's slowly creeping down and taking it over like Angkor Wat. Um, this one, there's absolutely no information about whatsoever, but this kind of um, just finding something that's overgrown like that. I mean, on the one hand, yeah, it's beautiful and it's fascinating, but I can't get any information about it. Or this one, which, and, and this is an important point, this is one that was very hard to find. Again, it's embedded in the middle of a city. The only way I could get a picture was to actually physically have this guy remove a door from outside the local library and climb up on the roof. And they do that. Like, they're, I just can't believe they're so wonderful. The people there are just fantastic. But, you know, I used to get so upset by seeing this. Like, how can you fill that with garbage, this incredible structure? But India also is a country where there's no garbage pickup. They don't have, I've seen like three garbage collectors the entire, all the times I've been there. And if you have a giant pit that nobody's using outside your home, why not throw the garbage in there? There's, it's better than to put it on the street. Um, some of these have just been destroyed by, this was the earthquake in Gujarat from 2001. You know, this is, and people say, well, why isn't the government in there preserving that? This is a very important step well. But it's in the middle of nowhere. Like, nobody's going to go and see that. I'm lucky I got to see it. And if you're a country like India, and Italy has had this problem too, where your history is such it goes back thousands and thousands of years, and there are that many important sites everywhere, do you give your money to the site in Delhi or Mumbai or close to one of those places or something that is like 200 miles away from anybody? Like, why would you put the money into it? It's just, it's sad, it's horrible, but it's the truth. This is what happens when there's water and uh, things get silted up. Uh, the silt can literally take over the step well. And now, because of the water crisis in India, there has been a renewed interest in step wells for their capabilities. Finally, people are like, wait a minute, they figured this out 1,500 years ago. How can we uh, make this work for us? Now, unfortunately, because uh, the water table in India has been 
depleted to the point of no return because of illegal bore wells, having um, a water table that used to be, well, like in Delhi. Um, let me see, where is that picture? There we go. This is that um, Agra Sen Kibali, which uh, in, in the 70s, this famous picture from, I think, 1971 by Raghu Rai on the right. And you can see this was before the, it was reconstructed. And you can see all these contemporary buildings. And this is the water level then during the monsoon. Lots of water. The water table at that time was about 30 feet below the surface in Delhi. And now it's 225 which is why they tried to reconnect some of these wells to their water table, and they can't. Other ones that have been silted up, they've had some success. If they can find the water, they can do it. And then, you know, this is a case on the left. This is a step well also from the 11th century. It's a fantastic step well in um, Ahmedabad that the government decided to preserve, which meant that they they uh, put a gate around it and locked it and wouldn't let anybody in. And the community grew up around this step well that was you know, really great. And they couldn't understand why they couldn't use it. And they finally just took it all, the gate away and tchotchkeed it up with all of these different you know, contemporary sculptures. And they, it's the most wonderful place when you go there. Um, it's called Mata Bhavani. It is, more like going to what a steppo would have been like a thousand years ago. You hear, you know, chanting and there's smells and you know, there's also goats walking around, and, but it's really an active temple. And when they're not active and you're not allowed to do it, they end up, oops, looking like this one on the right, which is from the same period, and it's just decrepit. The government told me a couple of years ago that they were gonna, they were planning to go and strip all of those things away from Mata Bhavani because you're not allowed to encroach on one of these one of these steples. And I was like, why? What did you do for it? You just, you, it's much better now. People can see it. It doesn't make sense. It sort of turned my feelings about preservation on their ear. I've had to completely rethink all of that. It's so another case. This is a very early step well from 600 on the right. I don't even know. The one on the left could be even earlier than that. But it's painted, it's gaudy, it looks awful from my standpoint, but it's used and it's valued by the community. Therefore, it gets you know straight A's, much better than the one on the right. And they are still being used. This is a pilgrimage site I went to recently and was like literally pushed out of the way by these pilgrims trying to get to the water so that they could drink it. <laughs> putting it in like the mouth of babies and stuff too. Sometimes it's still used, this is water that was being pumped to drink. Uh, but a lot of times you see these kind of pumps so people are using them when water is present often. Sometimes people are living in them. This is a fantastic step well in Madhya Pradesh where I found a family that said they were like scared when I showed up. They thought I was like from the government or something. Like, calm down. Like, no, this has been in our family. We were deeded this property. It's like, that's fine. I didn't even want to tell people where it was. Still using it to wash and, and their family living there. And so to me today, what I, the reason I wrote the book, which I didn't really want to write, but I knew that I had to claim the material and I want people to know about these because only by seeing them, demanding to see them, by knowing about them, will there be more preservation. They're being lost every day. And some architects have been using these too as inspiration, which is another great way of preserving them. This is Charles Correa, who obviously was, uh, you know, he, he used a lot of step well iconography in his work. This is an unbuilt project on the right, but it got a lot of awards from an Indian architect or repurposing step wells in another way. This is at this fantastic little hotel but, uh, just outside Jodhpur where they have a step well on their property. They have no information about it at all. But like once a week you can have dinner in the step well. And they take you there on this like mule drawn, you know, thing. It's really uncomfortable. And you get there and they've lit it up and there's a guy playing music in the middle and you're served food. It was fantastic. I was by myself, and they couldn't understand that. It's like, here's this romantic evening at the step. I'm like, what's next, you know? What's the next court? <laughs> 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 
non-governmental agencies are coming in and fixing them up. They're having a problem with these. Even when you fix up a step well, you have to get the community on board because just going in, adopting a step well, paying for it to be you know, desilted and painted, the community has to decide to take care of it, not just for next year, but forever. And already this one, which was in beautiful shape, is having some problems. Um, this is a project uh, in Jodhpur that isn't a step well, but it's using the same craftsmen who are making step wells, the type of the same technology. It actually recycles gray water from uh, this community. And then there's like my nemesis. Oh, I hate this thing. I know. There's, I just, I can't help it. I hate it. Like this should have done more for step wells than anything, more than my book. More people know about vessel in New York than it have ever heard of my book. And yet, nowhere was there a story about how this related to Steppos, just this derived from Indian Steppos. I can't tell you the number of magazines and newspapers I contacted. I mean, this is just the most, the biggest, $200 million to build this Instagram site, basically. And when I think of what that money could have been used for, and he never even really acknowledged. He says, yeah, influenced by Stepwells. I sent photographs of Stepwells to that studio in, in London, and I love a lot of their designs. <laughs> their reaction was to offer to buy the rights to my photographs. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, why would you do that to shut me down? Like, people know I'm not the only one that knows about these. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. You know, like, you get a lot of, like, oohs and ahs, but I just, I hate it. I just wish it would fall over. <laughs> Two years ago, they came out with a series of stamps devoted to step wells. There were like three pages of them. I thought that was great. They're beginning to come up in the world a little bit. And this is the last thing I'll show you, kind of. This is like what can happen if people put their money in the right way into a step well. This is in Jodhpur. I took this picture like five years ago. I knew it was a step well. I just thought, I should take a picture of that even though it looks awful and it stinks and there were dead things in it. But I better just, you know, I take pictures of everything. There's a really, really lovely hotel back here. Um, so I took that picture. Well, it turned out that the people who own that hotel, the Ross Hotel, finally decided they got so much complaints from the stinking smell from this stuff well, that they decided that they were going to clean it up. They knew it was from the 18th century. They had no idea what it looked like. Nobody had ever seen it. And so they hauled out 500 truckloads of that muck. I, you know, ugh, well, nightmare. OK, and that's how it looks today. And there's the Stepwell Suite is right up here of their hotel. And it's become a magnet for the community. There's restaurants all around it. That whole area is like number one tourist destination now in Jodhpur. It's fantastic, and if that's the only way, if some of these communities could just monetize their step well. This is what a step well search looks like, just so you know. This is like, I had this, I go, me, a Hindi driver who thinks I'm totally crazy, doesn't even understand what I'm looking for, will say, okay, like, ask that guy. So the guy will say, well, first go that way, and then go that way, and then go that way, and then go that way. <laughs> and we still couldn't find it. And my last picture is, the, this was like from one of my first step well jaunts, back when I still dressed like that when I went to India, and then fi finally I realized I should be dressing in blue jeans like everybody else. I looked like an idiot. But I was so, and this is like when I fell in love with Nimrana's step well and thought I was going to die. It's really scary to go down into that thing. And so I asked my driver to take a picture of me smiling because I wanted my son, who at the time was, I think, 16, I wanted him to have a picture of me smiling and happy after I died. <laughs> and that's all. Thank you so much. <laughs>Instagram. I, I put up a lot of stuff on Instagram, if any of you like Instagram, Victoria Lauman. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, yeah? So is there any way of hauling the water up, or is it really holding the jugs, you know, carrying the jugs all the way up to the bottom? 
the question is, can you haul the water up? And it, it depends. It depends on how deep the step well is. One of the ones that are like nine stories deep, really, if the water is at the no, there's just no way. But as the water rose, you could do that. And the problem is that, you know, in communities that, you know, if they were serving like hundreds of people or even dozens of people, you'd have to have access for more than to get to the water than just to be hauling it up. So there's always a draw well at a bona fide step well. There's always some apparatus to actually haul it up too. I just wasn't pointing that out, but yeah, good question. Um, let's just go like row by row. So you next, yeah. Does anyone know if Anthony Gowdy, I got Gowdy, uh, MC Escher ever went there? Nobody knows, but people always talk about Escher. And the other thing is if there's ever, I mean, when you really look at Escher and you look at these, the I can you can see because there's a lot of stairs and it's really confusing. It looks like Escher, but um, but it's not really like Escher when you look at them. The thing it does look like if there's any gamers or you've seen your grandkids gaming, um, what is it called? Uh, uh, Monument Valley, which is a level of some game. Do you know this, Conrad? Uh, you're no, you're not right. Anyway, there are actual stepples in a video game, which people kept commenting on my, on, my, um, on my Instagram feed. They kept saying, Monument Valley, Monument Valley. I'm like, this doesn't look anything like Monument Valley. Are you crazy? And I finally said something to somebody. It's like, yeah, you know, idiot. You, yeah, go. What is it that they're saying? Go. Um, what is it? Oh, never mind. Anyway, it's, it, it is part of a video game. But it doesn't, when you compare it to Escher, it's just that it's kind of like this mind craziness, but it doesn't really look, so it reminds you of that. I don't think he ever went to India and saw a step well. Go Boomer, that's what I was thinking, go Boomer. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, fabulous presentation, by the way. Thank you. I love doing it, you can tell I'm just a ham. <laughs> With a good topic. <laughs> I think it's aesthetic because I can show you, like some of them, it's got to be, a, I mean, well, I, don't, I can't 100% say. Maybe there was a structural reason for that. Um, it's possible that, uh, you know, so many of those have incredible, uh, sort of sturdy and large, um, what's that called, like almost bastions, like the, that they have to anchor everything in on the sides. Uh, so maybe the more stairs you had, the, the more stable it is. But I can show you others where it's just like just one staircase like zigzagging down. Like you saw one that was like that, that's really, really deep, really steep. But it's just like a thin zigzag. So I think a lot of those must have just been design decisions. And that one with the 3,500, I don't know. That's insane, particularly with a jug on your head. Yeah. Um, that ha was like the most difficult part of the book and um, what the, the person, there's a guy who wrote a book about the really huge step of Ronnie Kibao, the one that filled with silt, who was my lead consultant on that. I kept going back to him, talking to engineers, going back to him. What he said is that they would dig the shaft first. They would sink that, the circular shaft because that's how they had to find where the groundwater was. And the way that they dig that, did that is really crazy. I mean, I have some pictures from his book. I don't include them in here. They're really hard to read. But they would create this like circular wooden or stone thing that you would sit on and dig out the ground underneath and lower it and dig it more and lower it. And so when you look inside those shafts and they're they're, they're, um, they're uh, putting in the masonry or the brick, whatever, as they're digging the shaft. So when you look in those shafts, you actually see different courses of stone. You can see where those levels are. Then they would get to the bottom, and they would only do this during the dry season, of course, because once they hit the, the water, they have to really, you know, get, they, they, things could fill up. That's when it's the most dangerous. At the same time, at some point when they started digging that shaft, they begin to dig the trench that's coming in from the side. And 
you know, obviously you wonder, well, did they always hit up? <laughs> like, what, oops, you know, I wish I could get back to that first picture, but you know, my, they, so they had to be able to um, connect the shaft with the, uh, with the circular shaft, the shaft with the trench. And there's an area where the water from the shaft flows out into the trench so that when the water table rose, the water came from the shaft into the trench and rose that way. But you could also access the water directly in the shaft where there's always like a little pool. Usually there's rock. When you, you get down to it, it's always like solid rock at the bottom. And that's where the water would come in from. Um, but, you know, they had to be able to shore up the sides. Like, I don't know what order they did in. Yes, and no, there's no way. Well, and that's the other thing is where did the dirt go? Now there is there is a um, there is a uh, a group of people in India who that's what they do. The Bandaras who just dig holes. They're like they're itinerant diggers and go from town to town. They still they still exist, um, but I have no idea where the like those were like mountains of dirt that were taken out. I don't know. There's a lot that I don't know about, and frankly, like I go, uh, well, yeah, I could just lie and make something up. But the other people, they don't know either. Like nobody seems to know. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, I mean, we kind of know more about. Yeah, unless you're Eric Von Danigan, but um, okay, sorry. Don't ask any other tough ones like that. That was the <laughs> hardest part. And I got a review about that book that was it really nailed. It's like, this is a fabulous book with lots of information, not enough about the engineering. I mean, I really was just like, how do I get around this? Anything else? I am not, now that I've written that book, and I went to India for eight years for three months each time. It was, it was really hard and exhausting. And it's sort of like, I don't know, I don't have that obsession anymore. But when I go back to India, I haven't been now for two years because I moved to LA uh, a year and a half ago, and that was almost as arduous as going to India. Um, <laughs> so I probably, I'll go back to India, and when I go, I will always look at step wheels, but I'm not, like, I was driven. I was just driven. I mean, that was, and I, yeah, I just couldn't stop. So, what? Lead a tour? That I'd be the worst tour guide. But I'm happy to go along on a tour and show everybody the step up. But I could not lead a tour. I mean, if you have any more questions, please. I'll be out there signing the 15 copies of the book that are there. And uh, you know, if you know any other organizations that want to hear this talk, I'm always happy to come and do it. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>you honey I'm so glad you were here I really got to see that that was awesome <laughs> now where when